According to Yuslan, an American producer of the Batman film, we are in the golden age of comic books. In the 1950s and 1960s, Superman and Batman shows reflected the comics of the time. It is obvious that producers didn't draw very deeply on the source material, nor did they have deep personal connections to the characters. According to Kogan, the Renaissance has its roots in two central texts, which are Frank Miller's Batman The Dark Knight Returns from 1985, which is also actually directed by Tim Burton, and Alan Moore and Dave Gibson's The Watchmen from 1986. These two works, particularly Watchmen, opened up the superhero genre to a more complex psychological approach and demonstrated that serious relationship existed for superhero narratives. So what caused this? Kogan credits a generational shift. The new audience, movie producers, directors, and even the actors had a deep love and loyalty for the comics and characters as they often grew up reading them. And as a result, the companies were held to a higher standard and there was a more authentic portrayal of their beloved heroes. This was done by referencing 50 plus years of character development from the comics by using comic common references or inside jokes. Every superhero has certain tropes or familiar repeated moments that can also be used to deepen the connection between the movie and the comics. Although sometimes these tropes have to be changed to fit the big screen, the new successful movies change the tropes to only to help deepen the plot. For example, like how Spider-Man gets his powers from a spider bite in the movie instead of random radiation. The other important consistencies lies in resonant images, which are the images in comic books that are really symbolic. For example, the image of Superman floating outside of Lex Luthor's office window high above the streets of Metropolis. The Luthor Tower represents Lex Luthor's power over Metropolis, but Superman has superior power, independent to Luther. So the image of Superman floating outside of Luther's window embodies their relationship, the struggle to represent Metropolis. These are the little details that show the audience that the directors and producers really care. So why should we care about the Renaissance? Well, according to Kogan, the serious treatment of superheroes allows us to see the purpose and effect that the genre has on the society. By creating characters with believable stories and worlds in which other characters exist, it is easier to see how the films relate to common life. Kogan describes how the escapism of comics is used to expound on American identity through series of analogies, each one which reinforces a common co and comments on the other. Another thing that superhero flicks do well is promoting tolerance, as superheroes often represent characters who are outsiders in societies due to their special powers or differences in appearances. Both these topics I'll get into later when we talk about Edward Scissorhands. So the creation of the superhero genre is thought to be around the 1940s. And this is important because defining a genre can serve as the basis for examining how the genre narrative animates and ritualistically resolves basic cultural conflict and contradictions. And some examples of this are resolving the problems of binding adolescent males to the larger community, young males learning to apply their strength to benefit a social group, and selfish boys made into selfless men. These are all common themes in superhero movies. So how do we know that the genre was created in the 1940s? Because genres are created after they are named and defined, when they are able to be created into a parody because that means that enough people know enough about the genre that they can get a like joke making fun of it and when it's able to be repeated and imitated and based on some past history of comics we know that all of these things were happening by around the 1940s as I mentioned earlier, a superhero helps resolve the conflicts of binding adolescent males to the larger community. Tim Burton created the character of Edward Scissorhands based on his own feelings of isolation during adolescence in his suburban community. For those who don't know the story, Edward was created by an inventor who dies early, leaving Edward to fend for himself. One day, Peg Boggs, an Avon saleswoman, discovers Edward and takes him into her family. The movie follows his integration into suburban America. 
great superhero movies strive to portray what it would be like to live in the midst of superheroes. Kogan describes the importance of placing superheroes within a recognizable political, commercial, and cultural world. This movie is clearly set in suburbia. The color palette of both the set and the costumes are bright pastels that give a whimsical feel to the mundaneity of everyday life that's being portrayed. In addition, Kogan states that the story is typically told by an outsider. This way, the story shows what it would be like to live in the midst of the superheroes. According to Kogan, the world is not deformed by them, but the emotional feel of the world does change. Edward Scissorhands is told in past tense by an older version of Edward's love interest, the oldest daughter in the family, Kim. However, most of the story is seen from Edward's perspective, which allows us to see the suburbia and his interactions with the people there from the alien perspective of Edward, allowing us to closer see the hypocrisy and the ridiculousness of the characters. Besides the obvious abnormal costume and appearance, Edward's scissor, ha Edward's scissor hands are his superpower. One trait of superheroes is young men applying their strength to benefit the community, as we learned earlier. Immediately upon his arrival, Edward is the talk of suburbia. He starts a business of making shrub art, grooming dogs, and giving the woman in the town postmodern haircuts. Like Superman's strength, Edward's hands are his, both his greatest strength and his weakness. While he has the ability to create beautiful art and funky hairstyles, his scissor hands have the capacity to both destroy him and the ones he loves, which is a conflict that he struggles with throughout the film. In my opinion, Edward Scissorhands is the brilliant social satire about how different people are treated in our society. The members of the community both exploit Edward for his talents and simultaneously fear him and are quick to blame him when he steps slightly out of line. At the same time, he is bullied by the teenage boys and relentlessly pursued by the bored housewife who sees him as dangerous and sexy, but in reality, he's just a sensitive, scared boy. This shows the inability to see people who are different as whole people in our society, but rather instead a set of costs and or benefits. They even refer to him as handicapped and see themselves as saviors for taking him in. Kogan says that one important feature of superhero movies are that they allow for the active demonstration of the marginalized benefiting the mainstream. Every superhero is an outsider to society, but yet chooses to use their powers or skills to benefit it. Edward's story takes this a step further because it vividly shows the damage that is done as a result of using people for their specialness in a dehumanizing way. At its heart, Edward Scissorhands is a movie about acceptance. Kim sees Edward for who he truly is, not what he can do for her. And at the end, even though Edward Scissorhands has to leave, the town is changed irrevocably by his presence, as it snows every year after his departure. This is symbolic for the beauty that people with a different perspective can bring.